Ya. Selamat pagi para hadirin sekalian. Selamat datang di Fakultas Psikologi Universitas Indonesia. Pada hari ini, uh, sebelum acara dimulai, saya ingin memperkenalkan diri terlebih dahulu. Nama saya Anabel Wenas. Saya merupakan mahasiswa Fakultas Psikologi di Universitas Indonesia. Sebelum acara ini dimulai, saya ingin menyapa beberapa tamu, yaitu Welcome to Dr. William Byham, co-founder and CEO of Development Dimensions International, and Mrs. Caroline Byham. Uh, selamat datang juga kepada moderator pada hari ini, Mbak Vina Pendit, uh, psikolog dan juga Master of Administration. Beliau merupakan Vice President Pasti atau Perkumpulan Assessment Center Indonesia dan juga Direktur Daya 5 Recruitment. Selamat datang kepada Dr. Rosen Anwar, Founder and Commissioner uh, Daya Dimensi Indonesia. Selamat datang kepada seluruh jajaran manajemen dari Daya Dimensi Indonesia. Selamat datang kepada Dekan Fakultas Psikologi Universitas Indonesia, Bapak Dr. Wilman Dahlan Mansyur, Organizational Psychology. Selamat datang juga kepada Wakil Dekan Fakultas Psikologi UI, Dr. Cud Riva Mutia, MA Psikolog. Dan saya juga ingin menyambut kepada para mahasiswa dan juga staf pengajar dari Fakultas Psikologi Universitas Indonesia dan juga Universitas Pancasila. Sebelum acara ini dimulai, saya ingin mengingatkan bahwa terdapat feedback form di acara di buku acara. Oleh karena itu, mohon hadirin untuk mengisi feedback form tersebut dan feedback form tersebut akan dikumpulkan di meja registrasi di depan pada akhir acara. Sebelum acara ini dimulai, saya meminta para hadirin untuk berdiri terlebih dahulu bersama-sama. Please stand up, Mr. Dr. William C. Baham. And ya, yeah. bersama-sama kita akan menyanyikan lagu Indonesia Raya. Ya, yeah. uh, kita akan mulai bernyanyi setelah aba-aba dari saya. Baik. Tiga, dua, satu. Selesai. Terima kasih para hadirin dipersilakan duduk kembali. Sekarang saya akan memanggilkan Dekan Fakultas Psikologi Universitas Indonesia, Bapak Dr. Wilman Dahlan Mansur, untuk memberikan kata sambutan kepada Bapak dipersilakan. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to the master lecture with Dr. William C. Byham. 
First of all, I would like to extend a special welcome to our special lecture today, Dr. William C. Baham, the architect of assessment center methods for private and public organization, and the founder of Development Dimensi International, DDI. He is an industrial psychologist who will kindly deliver his lecture on assessment center around the world what works and what doesn't. Thank you, Dr. Byham, for your time here and your willing to come to University of Indonesia and share your knowledge and experience with us. I would also like to thank Mrs. G. Fina G. Pendit, Master of Art, the Vice President of Perkumpulan Assessment Center Indonesia. She is the alumni of Faculty of Psychology, and thank you that as an alumni, you still remember your previous university. This is an example how an alumni can support their alma mater. This master lecture is very important for us, especially because our country now need a, pers a good person. So assessment center, I think, is a good method, a sharp method that can help us, help organization, help the departments to choose, to select, and develop a good employees, a good national candidate for the future of this country. As we know, one of the inspiring speeches before the establishment of Faculty of Psychology was said by Professor Dr. Selamat Iman Santoso that how important it is to put the right man on the right place. Today, Dr. Byham's speech will cover up more about it, how important it is and how the assessment center around the world works and also how we can develop it in Indonesia. So please ask questions, because this is also an input to Mr. Byham about what we are thinking, what we are now, and what is our problem in our experience in applying assessment center in Indonesia or in doing our work that related or can be, can be benefit from assessment center uh, information, knowledge, or experience that we learn and we hear today. Finally, I would like to say many thanks to all of you who have come here to participate in this master lecture. I'm sure the lecture will give an insight and advantage for us in developing our knowledge on assessment center, our university, our organization, and also our nation. On behalf of this Faculty of Psychology, I open this master lecture. Enjoy the lecture and dialogue. Thank you. Terima kasih kepada Bapak Dekan atas sambutannya. Selanjutnya, sebelum saya memanggilkan moderator pada hari ini, saya ingin membacakan uh, bio dari Mbak Vina Pendit. Jadi Mbak Vina Pendit ini memiliki latar belakang pendidikan dari S2 Faculty of Social Science and Politi Politik University of Indonesia pada tahun 2012. Dan beliau juga uh, pernah mengikuti S1 Faculty of Psychology University of Indonesia Jakarta pada tahun 1990. After graduated dan sebelum bekerja di Daya Dimensi Indonesia, beliau merupakan training manager di Grand Hyatt Jakarta. Setelah itu, beliau bekerja sebagai marketing research surveyor, individual consultant, dan pada tahun 1996, beliau bergabung di Regional Consultant PT Daya Dimensi Indonesia. 
Sekarang, beliau merupakan Director of Selection and Assessment Services di PT Daya Dimensi Indonesia dan juga sekaligus sebagai Principal Consultant di DDI sekaligus sebagai Vice President of PASTI atau Perkumpulan Assessment Center Indonesia. Beberapa organisasi yang pernah ditangani oleh Mbak Vina Pendit selama di DDI adalah Medco Energy International, Toyota Astra Motor, Pertamina, Bank Mandiri, Lead Consultant Pemilihan Ketua KPK yang pertama, Bank Indonesia, BMW Indonesia, Nestle Indonesia, dan masih banyak lagi kontribusi yang pernah Mbak Vina berikan. Oleh karena itu, selanjutnya, without further ado, mari kita panggilkan moderator pada hari ini, Mbak Vina Pendi. Kepada Mbak Vina, dikebelakan. Selamat pagi semuanya. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera. Dr. Bahim, please. I would like to introduce Dr. Baham. Please have a seat. Uh, Dr. Baham is a co-founder, chairman, and CEO of Development Dimensions International (DDI). Uh, he got his PhD in Industrial Organizational Psychology from Purdue University. Uh, his bachelor and master degree is from Ohio University. He is a fellow in American Psychological Association. He is also a fellow in Society for Industrial and Organizational Psychology. He is a member of for Society for Human Resources Management. Uh, he is a diplomat in Industrial Organizational Psychology, American Board of Professional Psychology. Uh, he is also the first person introduced about assessment center to Indonesia sometimes in 1978. And then he's also the one uh, helping one organization in Indonesia, which is Telkom in Bandung, to start implementing assessment center in the organizations sometimes in 1990. So it starts uh, uh, doing the assessment centers for their talents in PT Telkom. Uh, I think without further ado, I would like you to start the okay. lecture. Along the way, throughout the lecture, if you have any questions, you may raise your hands. Ya, jadi silakan aja. Beliau lebih senang kalau kalau ada hal yang enggak uh, dipahami langsung aja ditanyakan. Jadi kita interaktif begitu ya. Selama ini kita sudah lima hari terus-terusan presentasi begitu caranya. Jadi akan akan lebih lebih senang kalau uh, setiap ada yang ingin ditanyakan langsung. Kita akan uh, mendengarkan paparan beliau, kita juga akan menyaksikan video. Uh, jadi berselang-seling begitu. Pokoknya kalau mau nanya silakan angkat tangan. Oke, okay. I think she's introduced uh, how I'm going to do it. Uh, we're going to uh, show you uh, an inter a series of videos that are the history of assessment centers. And I believe you're going to be surprised and interested. Uh, and so that'll give you a background. And then I'm going to give you a little bit of information about where uh, we are sort of now. Uh, and then and Vina's going to come back and talk about where we are in, uh, in Indonesia here. Uh, and then I'm going to to come back and talk about all kinds of new things and how assessment centers are changing and all that. But you need to get the basics before we talk about uh, the new things, okay? And I want to say for the third time, please ask questions because it'll help me a lot if you ask questions. So we can start the first video. Well. We, we have to get organized here, uh, but we're getting the video. Just I'll tell you what is an, what is an assessment center. Uh, 
It's, uh, it puts people in simulations of the jobs that they're going to have in the future. And then we evaluate them in those situations. And that is a very accurate way of predicting success in a job. And I'll be telling you about lots of research. One of the big differences in, uh, with the assessment center method and a lot of other methods of predicting uh, success is that we have lots of real data, lots of research data. So now I'm ready for the video. <laughs> into World War II, the United States needed intelligence on its adversaries and needed to select people to work with resistance groups behind enemy lines from among its recruits. Thus, the U.S. got into the spy business. Six months after the attack on Pearl Harbor, a new agency was formed called the Office of Strategic Services. President Roosevelt turned to William Wild Bill Donovan, an eminent Wall Street lawyer and World War I hero to head up the OSS. When some of his agents suffered breakdowns in the field or exhibited other failings that might have been detected earlier, Donovan looked for new ways of selecting agents. The idea for an assessment center came from Major James A. Hamilton, a psychiatrist, and Captain John Gardner, a psychologist, who sold the bold idea to the OSS staff. I knew the field of conventional testing by heart. That had been the field in which I had done my teaching. And I was greatly troubled by the limitations of the paper and pencil tests. The assessment approach seemed to me a very broad and exciting path out of that, uh, out of that field. A path of future growth for a field that was becoming inevitably more and more constricted. Hamilton set up the internal procedures and found a site at which the assessments would be conducted, the Willard Estate in Fairfax, Virginia, from then on known as Station S. Gardner recruited a staff. Henry Murray was one of the first recruits. Murray brought with him some of the exercises he had developed at Harvard, including the thematic apperception test. However, he and his colleagues made up most of the simulations on the spot. He did that was just about as fast as you could walk over the, uh, the terrain. Uh, and, and of course, as we, uh, as we tried out the different groups that came along, we of course learned that that isn't a good thing. From this hastily developed start came the belongings observation exercise. In the exercise, a candidate was given a brief time to observe the contents of a room filled with the personal belongings of its former occupant. Then, the candidate was escorted to another room and given a 36-item questionnaire about the room. Assessment at Station S ran in two-week cycles. Three groups of 18 candidates each were assessed in the two weeks. Candidates were issued army fatigues and boots and told to concoct a false story about themselves. No truth about themselves could be revealed except under defined conditions. Thus, the OSS Assessment Center became one grand exercise aimed at selecting intelligence agents able to survive under a cover story in foreign and hostile countries. A former graduate student of Murray's, Dr. Donald McKinnon, came to Washington, D.C. to be the second director of Station S. He perfected many of the exercises. We had uh, uh, simulations in the field because many of our people are going overseas to work uh, behind the enemy line with the leaders of resistance groups. And uh, so uh, we had outdoor exercises where a log was to be imagined as a heavy gun to be transported over a deep ravine, which is in reality a little stream running right. through the land and uh, with very minimal materials to accomplish this task. The uh, task was given to the person being assessed to get this done. And uh, sometimes with disastrous effects, <laughs> humorous <laughs> effects, uh, we had uh, another very famous uh, situation in which uh, behind the barn, you know, the subject had direct uh, two uh, characters in putting a structure together, a kind of a glorified huge uh, mechano set. These characters, uh, one played the role of an overly energetic, uh, helpful but dumb guy, 
the other lazy fault finder. And no matter how tactful the candidate might be in directing these people, they could see to it that they could frustrate, frustrate him and thwart him. And uh, actually, upon a few occasions of many, the assessee lost his temper and <laughs> laid into these assistants, these uh, role players. Uh, we had uh, uh, simulations where a person had to go into a room in a barn, presumably a room where uh, an agent uh, had been living and he'd uh, disappeared and the problem was to get in and get material and get out before he might be caught. Another one was where uh, the leader had to take a group over imagined mind road, uh, that sort of thing, as well then as having indoor exercises. So we had discussions. Uh, what should be done with Germany after the war is over was a very lively topic, of course, uh, which I think uh, most of the candidates enjoyed participating in. Observation and memory were tested using a map memory exercise. After being given eight minutes to memorize a complicated map, the map was taken away, and the candidate was asked highly detailed questions about the lay of the land. There was a cross-country course laid out with a series of obstacles, such as this one, in which the candidate had to capture a tin can hanging from a branch. At each stop, candidates had to solve a problem involving ingenuity and quick thinking under the pressure of time. Athletic ability was also assessed. The candidates swung from rings, climbed high walls, and skittered across a catwalk. In a test of group cooperation, candidates as a team had to lift the sides of a large spiral in order to roll a ball up a path and have the ball stop at the top. Only one team in the history of Station S was able to do it successfully within the time limit. A particularly difficult simulation was the stress interview. With a spotlight burning in the candidate's face, assessors attempted to break down the person's cover story. Life and death were being played out at Station S, and the assessment staff fully realized the gravity of their decisions. The staff was divided into teams of two senior and one junior staff member. Each team was assigned five to seven candidates. Their task was to develop as complete a profile as possible on each person. On the last day of assessment, a meeting was held to agree on ratings for each candidate. Additional OSS assessment centers were started in Washington, D.C., California, and later in China, India, and Ceylon, which is present-day Sri Lanka. Exercises were adapted for changing needs and locations. For example, this simulation in a pool in California was used to evaluate skills needed for an assignment in the South Pacific. By the end of the war, more than 7,000 people had been evaluated. Out of this experience came the landmark book, Assessment of Men, which chronicled the OSS assessments. And uh, so you had these two experiences, actually. Uh, before the OSS that you just saw, heard about, the British had really invented the uh, system uh, to select officers. At the beginning of World War II, they uh, used the old-fashioned method of taking high-powered people, you know, the, the aristocracy and uh, people who had political connections, and 50% of those people flunked out of officer training. And so they knew that they couldn't have that. They had to get something that would get good people. And so they really invented the assessment center method and used it all throughout uh, World War II. Uh, the OSS, when they started, they looked at what British, the British were doing and they adapted it for spies. Okay, and now you're going to see next, you're going to get to see how it was adapted for business. Well, I read The Assessment of Men, the classic book which came out in 1948, and I found it uh, extremely exciting. 
uh, because it offered such an alternative to standardized uh, paper and pencil testing and uh, biographical data uh, as an alternative or in addition to uh, how to evaluate people. At about the same time, the Director of Management Development and Research at AT&T, Robert Greenleaf, conceived the idea of a longitudinal study of how managers developed. He thought it would provide useful information for selection and development programs, and he hired Bray to implement his idea. The original design of the Management Progress Study was much more modest than uh, it eventually became. Uh, the plan was that uh, we would put people through a three-day assessment center, it turned out to be a fair number, uh, and uh, learn everything we could about their abilities, personality, and motivation, and then we would follow them by interviews and, and uh, check with the company people about them for maybe five to eight years, and then we would write our research report, and uh, that would be it. Uh, little did we know that it would extend uh, for several decades uh, after the original start. At a converted mansion in St. Clair, Michigan, and at four other locations, 422 college recruits and non-college individuals on their way up were evaluated. Academicians were used as assessors. The assessees were interviewed, took paper and pencil tests, and completed personality instruments. The most unusual feature of the assessment center was its business exercises. We had three major simulations in the original management progress study assessment centers. Uh, one was an in-basket, uh, one was a leaderless group discussion with assigned roles, and another was a, a short, simple business game. The in-basket was a new evaluation methodology. The assessee was presented with memos, reports, and records of telephone calls that might well accumulate on the desk of a district level manager. In responding to these items, the assessee had to initiate meetings, delegate tasks, make decisions, and evaluate plans. The management game, which used Tinker Toys, also was new. A team bought Tinker Toy parts and put them together to make one of five toys, which they would then sell back to the assessors at market prices. The prices of both the raw materials and the completed Tinker Toys fluctuated every few minutes throughout the game. And of course, we were looking for leadership, uh, again, planning and organizing, uh, again, resistance to stress, because this would get pretty stressful if the prices changed just when you were going to sell a uh, product in which you'd put quite a bit of labor and the market went down. The assessment experience was a grueling three days for the assessees. When they returned to their jobs, the assessors met to pool their observations of each candidate and reach an overall judgment regarding his potential. The AT&T Assessment Center was a major step forward for assessment center methodology. Not only was it the first industrial application, it also saw the first use of exercises that would become standard elements of most future assessment centers. The in-basket exercise and the management game. It was also the first to emphasize consistency in evaluation methodology. Because of the hectic circumstances in which they were developed and operated, both the War Office Selection Board and the OSS centers changed exercises frequently. At AT&T, participants went through exactly the same exercises within the same time limits. Assessors also processed data differently. Until that time, a lead assessor read all the reports, made a tentative integration of the data, and then read his report to the other assessors, and it was discussed. Bray's method allowed assessors to hear one another's exercise observation report and discuss candidate performance in each dimension or competency as a group. After the assessment center, Bray and his colleagues followed the careers of the assessees to determine their progress. The the progress of those who did well in assessment was at least twice as fast and far as those who did not do well in assessment. And the uh, prediction of termination, although not quite that exact, uh, was also very significant and would be very helpful in uh, actually selecting people for long-term employment. Even before Bray and his colleagues had completed their validation study, they began getting requests from other Bell Telephone units for different assessment centers. And when they heard about this assessment center, they said, gee, why can't we use that to uh, help pick foremen? 
We tried that in uh, 1958, and it was a great success uh, from the beginning. Uh, and after that, it spread, uh, of course, it spread to the outside world as well. But the first diffusion of this method was within the telephone companies, uh, where it spread very widely. And within a few years, perhaps 10 rather than a few, over 200,000 candidates for the job of foreman had been assessed. The Bell Operating Company assessment centers were the first to be staffed entirely by lay people. Unique assessor training programs were developed, and the orientation of the center was switched from clinical judgments to a more behavioral approach. Assessors were encouraged to use the behavior observed in the exercises to predict future behavior on the job, not to try to be amateur psychologists. The competencies sought were determined by job analysis, rather than educated guesses. By 1970, 12 organizations in the United States were using the assessment center method, including Standard Oil of Ohio, Caterpillar, IBM, GE, Wix, and J.C. Penney. Many of them conducted their own validity studies, proving the accuracy of the method. But knowledge of the methodology was largely restricted to a few practicing industrial psychologists familiar with the AT&T research. That changed quickly, thanks to a creative psychologist, Dr. William Byam, who developed an assessment center for J.C. Penney Company. Right after our very positive experience with the method of J.C. Penney, I decided it was time to write a popular article about the method. So I did that and published it in the Harvard Business Review. A number of representatives of big companies read it and called me up and said, hey, I like this idea, how do I get one? In 1970, Byam and Bray formed DDI, Development Dimensions International, to help organizations capitalize on the assessment center method. The availability of experienced consultants and tested simulations fueled the rapid growth of assessment centers throughout the world. DDI started off with some pretty big clients, like Shell Oil, Ford Motor Company, Caterpillar Tractor. And basically, we were putting in assessment centers pretty much like AT&T had used and that I had used at JCPenney. But very quickly, we had to develop lots of new simulations, new tests and things to meet the spatial needs of our clients. Assessment centers soon were being used in a broad array of settings, including education, hospitals, public safety, and at many levels of state and federal government. The assessment center method was even re-established within the Central Intelligence Agency, the successor of the OSS. So that brings you sort of up to date 20 years ago, up 30 years ago. But I want to emphasize again that the data for the business use of assessment centers came from fundamental research. The, uh, if you're studying uh, organizational psychology, you should know about the management progress study because it is the single most important research study ever made in organizational psychology. It was because it, it was dealing with the largest company in the world at that time, AT&T, they had a lot of money, and so they decided that they wanted to find out what made people succeed in their organization. And to do that, they hired Doug Bray from Yale, and they invented, reinvented the assessment center method because it had been used before, as I've told you, but had never been tried in business. And he wanted to get a baseline look at young people coming into management, coming into management from the uh, universities and also being promoted uh, into management. And he took 400 of these people and put them through the first business assessment center. Uh, and but the wonderful thing he did, and why it's such a wonderful exper experiment, is that he never told the people how they were doing, and he never told the management how they were doing. It was completely held. And then, after 
five years, he went back to look to see how well they were doing. And then he went back after 10 years, and then he went back after 20 years, and then he went back after 25 years and, and watched what happened. And sure enough, the assessment center was predicting who could go f higher in the organization and how fast they could move in very, very high prediction. And so I, I just think that's so important for you to understand because this was pure research. Pure, there was no practical use of this data. It was pure research. Uh, and I said, you have to be the biggest company in the world to appreciate it. Cost, it costs millions of dollars to do. Uh, and, but what happened was, as you saw in the movie, uh, the people within AT&T heard about the, after the first five years, they saw, ah, maybe we've got something there, and they put in their own version of assessment centers, and that's what spread around the world, is the version that AT&T put in. But then uh, I, there was a small group of IO psychologists uh, in New York City, I was one of them, uh, and these were the biggest companies of the world, frankly, General Motors and GE and IBM and those people at that time, and we all were friends. And Doug Gray was, couldn't wait to tell all of his friends about the findings of his research. So we watched the research unfold over the years. And then one by one of us, IBM and GE, they said, we'd like to try one too. And Doug Bray then coached them and let them sit in and things like that. And so they got going. And he did that for me at JCPenney. And I put in the first retail assessment center where we used it to select managers. We were finding at JCPenney that we had a thousand, almost 2,000 stores. And they were small stores uh, that would employ 50 people or something like that. Uh, but the trend at that time was to build big stores, huge big box stores in shopping centers. And what we were finding was that people who were very successful at running these small stores failed when they put them in the higher level job. And that's because the job of a higher level manager where you have four or five hundred people working for you is very different. You have to be, do more delegating. You have to be more systematic. You have to, you have, to have, be, have more strategy involved. You have to work with all the other people in the shopping mall because you have to coordinate things. And so the job is different. And just because you were good at one level didn't mean that you were going to be good at the other. So what I did in my assessment center was that I simulated the higher level job and put them, and it's like uh, we put them in the job for doing two and a half days. And then we watched them in that job and we used that information to predict the future. And that's the whole way that we operate assessment centers. Now, let me tell you what an assessment center is. Thank you. It has behavioral targets. We call them competencies uh, or dimensions. Uh, and something called key actions, which I'm going to tell you what that is. Those are the sub-parts of the, co of the uh, competency. Uh, uses at least two behavioral simulations. We use 10 or 12 most of the time, but the minimum would be two. Uh, provides an opportunity for free form answers. And I can't be more, uh, this is extremely important. Uh, this is not a multiple choice test. Uh, that you, you, what happens is that you're put in a room with somebody who maybe is not performing well and you have to talk to them about their poor performance. It's, you're sitting with a real live person you're not having a multiple choice that says, would you do this or would you do that? You have to talk to the person and decide what to do and, to, and, and, and deal with it. Uh, 
It uses multiple trained assessors. So you're not just observed by one person. In each exercise, you're observed by one person. But you're observed by different people in different exercises. And that's important because it, it, you, you know that you could, if you would do poorly in one exercise, and then you would go, be seen by the same assessor in another exercise, that probably has a little bias because he's expecting you to do poorly again. But we don't have that because we're having different assessors in the different exercises. But the key thing is, the most important element that you don't want to lose is good data integration. So now the, all the people that have observed a single person, they come together in a meeting and they share their observations. And together they make a decision. And we know in our psychology studies that if you get three people together with good data, they're going to make a better decision than one person by himself. And the other thing it does is it keeps the assessors very honest because they have to use behavior to convince the other assessors. Uh, they can't say, I thought he showed very good judgment in this exercise. They'll laugh at it. They, you have to say, he showed good judgment because he did this and he said this and, and so forth. Uh, and you have to describe their behavior. And if you don't, then the other people are not going to listen to you. They're not going to pay attention to what your data are. are. And so the whole act of knowing that assessors know they have to prove their point of view keeps them honest and it builds uh, behavioral tension into the process. Okay? Uh, and then they, uh, we write a nice report and they get, people get a report on themselves and it's very developmental and I'm going to get into that in a minute. Uh, and, of course, it can be used to decide who gets promoted or who gets moved into what, okay? And so I've already hit that. It's not multiple choice, and it's not one, because this is a problem in Indonesia, frankly. There are people who say they have assessment centers, but actually they have a multiple choice test. Uh, it, they have an in-basket, but it's then for each item in the in-basket, you get multiple choice for which one you, uh, uh, which, how, what you would do. And the world is not like that, I guarantee you. And the other thing is that some psychologists are trying to do it by themselves. And so they interview people and put them through a little simulation and give them tests, and they're calling that an assessment center. I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just saying it's not an assessment center. Uh, and, okay? Now, before I get, you be interested in knowing what we're doing in Indonesia, right? So you're going to talk here? Is this where you're going to show your movie? We, we, we are, we've never done it quite this way, see, so we're a little tentative here. But we thought that would be, do you think this is a good place? Okay. Then I need this, the slide, the last slide. <laughs> Sorry, well, if you want to. Oh, I just don't know. Oh, no, it's okay. saya menjelaskan tentang bagaimana sih di Indonesia sebelum beliau lanjut ke yang slide berikutnya nah, di Indonesia ini seperti tadi saya sampaikan di awal dimulainya sebenarnya ide uh, beliau datang ke sini memberikan penjelasan tentang apa itu metode assessment center lalu salah satu pimpinannya PT Telkom almarhum Bapak Cacu Sudaryanto waktu itu uh, kemudian uh, memiliki tugas saat itu di Telkom bahwa uh, Telkom itu kan dibagi atas regional-regional ya dia harus memilih siapa yang akan ditempatkan sebagai head of the region dari PT Telkom nah karena pemilihan itu dia ingin pemilihan yang sifatnya fair nah dia berpikir harus ada suatu metode bagaimana menyaring manajer-manajer yang ada untuk siap menjadi seorang regional manager. Nah di Telkom itulah mereka uh, terpikir untuk memilih top top 100, top 50, top 300 gitu. Nah itu uh, uh, 
beliau punya HR manager namanya Pak Fajar Bastaman itu yang ditugaskan untuk mencari nih carilah metode untuk menyaring. Nah eh, tahun 1988 dibantu oleh DDI Telkom mulai men- melatih para eh, manajer eh, psikolog yang ada di sana. Jadi banyak dari mereka itu eh, adalah psikolog eh, dari Unpad jadinya. Jadi jadi uh, teman-teman kita dari Unpad tuh jauh lebih menguasai ya tentang ilmu ini dibandingin kita sebenarnya di sini. Karena itulah inisiasi pertama dan senternya sendiri juga adanya di Bandung. Kemudian uh, uh, karena beliau sudah mulai mengimplementasikan tahun 90, Pak Fajar ini uh, mempresentasikan apa yang dia lakukan di Kongres Internasional di Atlanta. Jadi saya juga mau cerita bahwa assessment center sebagai komunitas itu secara berkala setiap tahun melakukan kongres internasional. Pesertanya itu dari seluruh dunia. Nah Indonesia termasuk yang karena dari awal juga ini rajin ikut ya mengirimkan pesertanya ke sana. E, sampai dengan sekarang assessment center Telkom itu masih terus berjalan. Jadi sudah 23 tahun mereka. Nah Di tahun 2001, saya bersama rekan-rekan yang e, menerapkan assessment center, menggunakan assessment center sebagai asesor atau sebagai orang yang pernah jadi asesi, itu berkumpul bersama untuk kemudian berpikir, ini e, wacana assessment center ini sebagai sebuah metodologi, itu makin kemana-mana. Seperti yang beliau katakan, jadi banyak institusi, banyak organisasi, banyak individu yang mengatakan saya punya assessment center tapi sebenarnya apa yang dilakukan bukan assessment center. Jadi mereka mengumpulkan series of test, mereka bilang ya ini assessment center, bahkan surprisingly saya jalan ke Jogja, kemana tuh ada sebuah ruko judulnya assessment center gitu, menerima uh, apa dan ada pelatihan untuk lolos assessment center gitu. Orang Indonesia kan kreatif ya. Nah, terus kita berkumpul bersama, kemudian mem, me, bagaimana caranya kita e, memiliki e, etika pelaksanaan kita sebutnya. Dia, dia tidak memiliki konsekuensi hukum memang, tetapi e, dia menjadi acuan bagi siapapun mau praktisi, penyelenggara, e, asesor, maupun organisasi yang ingin mengirimkan orang-orangnya itu jadi tahu sebenarnya assessment center yang sesungguhnya itu yang seperti apa. Nah guidelines ini tentunya kita ingin juga berstandar internasional. Jadi ketika guidelines ini kita bentuk, saya bawa ke Kongres Internasional untuk mendapatkan feedback. Jadi di saat yang sama juga dari dari Jerman juga. Jadi di dunia tuh cuma ada tiga yang punya Amerika, Indonesia. What what the other country that has the ethical guidelines? Oh, just South Africa. South Africa and Indonesia. Indonesia. Jadi hebat Indonesia. <laughs> Jadi Jerman aja waktu itu udah ngusulin nggak final juga akhirnya, gitu. Kemudian di di tahun uh, karena itu kan uh, waktu kita menuliskan itu kita uh, internasional kita ke dalam juga. Jadi kita baru benar-benar fix dan bisa kita launch itu di tahun 2004. Nah dari sanalah uh, kita membentuk perkumpulan assessment center Indonesia. pasti itu dan mulai melakukan kongres. Jadi kongres kita yang terakhir itu adalah baru aja selesai kemarin dari tanggal 21 sampai dengan 23. Uh, yang yang informasi yang bisa saya sampaikan dari kegiatan-kegiatan ini adalah sekarang assessment center itu menjadi salah satu prasyarat ya, prasyarat untuk promosi eselon 2 dan eselon 1. Aparat, aparat sipil negara. Jadi sudah masuk ke dalam peraturan. Jadi kenapa saya e, dan teman-teman saya dari DDI itu insis sekali memaksa ini harus kita bawa nih ke kampus. Ya, kita harus lakukan e, kuliah umum ini karena kebutuhan di masyarakat akan mereka yang memahami bisa menerapkan dan mempraktekkan metode ini jadi sangat luas. bahkan beberapa BKN sudah memiliki BKN itu Badan Kepegawaian Negara sampai hari ini mereka sudah mengakses lebih dari 7.000. Nah, kita bayangkan pegawai negeri sipil ada berapa? 4,2 juta. 
ya kita nggak ngomong 4,2 juta di assess ya, mungkin berapa persennya saja untuk eselon 2 dan eselon 1, kita ngomong ratusan ribu orang dan itu kan terus ya berganti, entah karena pensiun atau apa akan terus berganti jadi beberapa pemerintahan daerah juga sudah punya sekarang pemerintah daerah e, Jawa Tengah, Jawa Timur, Jogja, Nusa Tenggara Barat, Nusa Tenggara Timur jadi sudah lima yang sudah punya di pemerintahan daerah selain di BKN sendiri Kementerian PAN juga juga akan segera membentuk. Jadi eh, saya saya pribadi dan rekan-rekan saya di DDI merasa sebenarnya se sebagai metode ini ini jadi seharusnya menjadi bagian yang dipelajari juga di kampus. Karena ini adalah ilmu aplikasi yang paling nyata dari psikologi industri dan organisasi menurut saya. Jadi ini adalah sesuatu yang bisa kita terapkan. Dan kedepannya makin banyak lembaga negara yang ingin menerapkan hal ini kalau swasta udah nggak kehitung klien-klien kami jadi e, penyelenggara assessment center aja sudah ada belasan di Indonesia ini dan saya juga nggak tahu apakah semuanya juga mengikuti etika pelaksanaan ini atau tidak tetapi penyelenggaranya sudah sangat banyak kami sendiri di DDI itu ada 300 lebih klien kita yang kita ladeni untuk dan per tahun itu kita di atas 2000 orang kita ases jadi sebenarnya kalau di dia suruh bekerja sendiri juga nggak akan sanggup mengcover in Indonesia yang 240 juta orang. Jadi rasanya penting sekali kita hari ini memahami, bertanya sepuas-puasnya dan mungkin kita nanti punya orang-orang yang mengkhususkan diri mempelajari ini, meneliti hal ini. Karena saya percaya di, di Kongres kemarin saya ketemu sama alumni sini juga, Hana, Hana Panggabean. Dia banyak sekali meneliti tentang leadership leadership di Indonesia uh, dari segi bagaimana culture dan seterusnya dan dia senang sekali dia bilang ayo mbak kita habis ini let's define ya kalau kita mengakses leadershipnya orang Indonesia leader-leader di Indonesia tuh gimana jadi kita janjian untuk kita ketemu lagi saya sih pengennya juga dari fakultas psikologi juga ada yang ikut dalam forum-forum itu karena forum itu terus bergerak dan kita uh, setelah itu kita bikin apa yang khas Indonesia karena bagaimanapun juga kita harus menyadari ilmu ini datangnya dari sana ada aspek-aspek kultur Indonesia yang berpengaruh saya rasa kalau dari saya itu saya bisa kembalikan kepada beliau so back to you again. Yeah, yours is going on. I'll take mine okay, okay. Uh, this is it. Good job. Uh, uh, so do, uh, I'm going to go on and just tell you about uh, applications of assessment centers, representative applications, and I'm going to do it by organizational level. So I'm going to start at the bottom and work up. Uh, the, the hierarchy uh, and the, the lowest level uh, is first level jobs and that's the least use of assessment centers but there are some sort of interesting uh, applications and I'll just tell you a couple uh, the biggest one believe it or not is to hire people to work in modern automobile factories it used to be that working in an automobile factory was just a terrible job. You were doing the same thing over and over, you know, putting in a bolt or putting in a windshield or something, and there couldn't be a worse job. But what the Japanese did was to figure out that, and, and by the way, they made one kind of car for two or three years. Then they had a big turnover of, of the model year, and then they made another car, you know. Well, the Japanese figured out that that was a big waste of time and effort, and you, you couldn't adjust the amount of cars that you were making to the buyers. So, uh, so they discovered that you could you make five or six cars on one assembly line, and they automated all the ordinary things, like putting in the windshield. That's all done by robot now. And so the jobs, 
became much more sophisticated and they their big part of it was to keep looking for better ways to do the job and you had to be able to jump from one job to another and work as a team and, and this is sort of a prototype of what modern industrial work is like. It's a lot different than what we see in the movies, that, you know, what it used to be. Well, it takes a different kind of person. And it, I, this story is, shows you the power of competition. Uh, because, oh, 25 or 30 years ago, Toyota came wanted to open up an automobile plant in America. It was going to be the first automobile plant. And they were f scared to death because they said, we'll never get American workers who were as good as Japanese workers. And, uh, and so they, they just were scared to death. And they came to our company, DDI, and said, could you help us? And we looked them in the eye and we said, we will get you American workers who are just as good or better than the Japanese workers. And, and we did that by putting the, it, them through an assessment center. They, we made models of car, real cars, big models, and they had to do the jobs. We trained them, and then they had to do the jobs that they were going to have to do on the job. And we would put them, and we would give them ways to do things that were not very good that were not very efficient. And then we would put them together in a team to see if they could figure out a better way to do, the, to do it and, uh, and how well they could work in a team and things. Well, to make a long story short, within two, we, they were very satisfied with the employees they got. They said they're just as good as the Japanese. And in two years, uh, that was the most productive automobile plant in all of America. And so what happened, the rest of the story is that the other big plant companies that wanted to open up new automobile plants, they came to us and they said, we don't want an automobile plant like we used to have. We want one like the Japanese have and we want employees like the Japanese. So you give us employees like the Japanese also. So, that, so that's how it got started and it's used uh, throughout the automobile business. Uh, and and it's, uh, another uh, use uh, of it is that, of course, big companies uh, get thousands and thousands of applicants and they uh, usually use some kind of testing and things and certainly interviewing to uh, decide which applicants to hire. But many, many of them bring their applicants to the corporate headquarters or some facility and they put them through a one-day assessment center to decide which of the applicants, the final cut, you know, that they're going to use. And they use assessment centers for that. Okay, the big use, the big, by far biggest use of assessment center is to, for, for, to choose supervisors, first level supervisors. Why do you think that is? Why is that a big use? Well, one answer, of course, is there are more supervisors than anything else. <laughs> so that's one answer. But what's the real answer? Why would they choose to do it for first level supervisors? That it's because that's a huge jump in job requirements. You can be a wonderful worker or a scientist or salesperson or any thing like that at the first level. But just because you're a good salesperson does not make you a good manager. Or just because you're a very smart, highly educated, high tech pe person does not mean that they are going to be a good manager. They, the competencies that are required for management are very different than the ones in a technical kind of job or any other kind of job. And so organizations use assessment centers to find people that have the ability to make that jump. Uh, the, now, uh, what's new 
in this area that I talked about at the Congress here is we've pretty much automated that assessment centers, those assessment centers. We've changed, we still have assessors, but we've changed their jobs. We're doing, we're collecting data. Instead of them taking notes like they used to, they, uh, we collect that on videotape, and there's lots of new things that are involved that have allowed us to lower the cost of assessment substantially. Uh, now, the, one of the big things that we've done is to go beyond the competency. Remember, when what we do at the beginning of an assessment center, when we're putting money in, is to study the, what makes people good in the job and what makes people poor. So we interview people about the biggest decisions they have to make and the biggest problems they solve, and we interview their bosses about what's the difference between good people and poor people, and we come up with a, uh, a list of competencies that describe the job, and those are the targets that we look for in the assessment center, and we make simulations for those targets. But a, but a, a competency is not a behavior. The behavior, a competency is a collection of behaviors that relate to effective job performance. And so what you really do in a job analysis is to look for the behavior that is associated with positive performance or not. And you, when they look, they find that, that work together, you come up with a competency. So you have a competency and in it are sub behaviors that, that, you, that make up success. I'll give you an example. Here a competency is resolving workplace conflict. That's a common thing. People, if you get a bunch of people together, there'd be some people that don't work well together, right? And so one of the jobs of a manager is to fix that, to, to, so it doesn't disrupt work. And so we say, we, from our research, this is all done on very heavy research, that there are six things that are part of that competency. And so those are, you can read them there. So we believe that the breakthrough here is in the depth of insight. And we used to look at competencies and we would evaluate competencies. And that's like taking an x-ray of people. If someone comes in and they have a physical problem, you might take an x-ray. And that would tell you the competencies. But now, the newest thing is to go below the x-ray and do an MRI. And this is what we're doing now. This is at the MRI level to get to the detail of the competency because it is more accurate when we make decisions. We, if the more we know about the person, the better. And sometimes we'll find that, that he, may, he may not be high in a competency, but it's some part of the competency that isn't so important or we can easily fix or something. And that gives you a, a better insight into who to hire, right? But the big thing, the big, big thing is, is it improves the development of the individual. So if, if I say to you, uh, you're, this person is not good at delegating, uh, you know, giving assignments to other people, uh, then so I means, well, I have to find a, pr a whole program that would uh, deal with delegation, and then we try to train them in that, or we try to coach them in that, right? Okay, but, but what if we, but a delegation has a number of parts. You have to decide what you're going to delegate, who you're going to delegate it to, how you're going to delegate it, how you're going to check for understanding as they understand their delegation, how you're going to follow up and empower the people. Those are the sub parts. And 
you don't have, maybe you're only bad in one of them, and then you can focus your training on the thing that, they're, that they don't have and speed up the, uh, the development of people. The, I know it's hard for you to, to think that there are lots of jobs that are going open out there, but I guarantee you there are, particularly at high levels of management. Every, the higher levels of management are looking down, where am I going to get my people in the future? And how am I going, and you know, they're not going to find perfect people in the organization. They're going to have people who have strengths and have some weaknesses. Everybody does. But instead of just saying he doesn't do a good job of delegating, if we can figure out what part of that he's doing poor in, then we can much more accurately develop. We can fo focus the development at the right level. And that's why when you go to a doctor and they use an MRI, they can focus the, the uh, problem solving uh, on, the, on a more uh, exact level. Okay, so, uh, so we use uh, assessment centers for selection. And what you end up doing is uh, having the names of people uh, in, in that you're selecting. These are usually promotion from within. And then these are competencies across just some of the competencies that you would be using. And you, uh, you would have ratings and you could see who people are. And mainly uh, what, what, what areas in which they need development. So in development, now you might wonder, well, how do people do on assessment centers at first level? Would anybody be Here it is in America, uh, and the proficiency, these are taking people who are 4,000 people who are already supervisors and putting them through an assessment center for development. And you find that, that there's a lot of people who need a lot of development. You do not have a normal curve here. The normal curve, this would be the highest, right? Uh, they, it's used to here, to this level. Uh, and so there's a lot of people who are in supervisory jobs that need development. And then we, of course, have the data underneath. So we know what key actions and what competencies they need development in. And that's going to add to, to push your development. It, would anybody be interested to know, how, how do you think the Chinese are on this? Are they better or worse? Better? Did somebody say, okay. Uh, they are actually a little bit worse. Uh, they, uh, uh, and so uh, the education, the academic education of Japanese is not very behavioral. They, it's a lot of memory and everything, and so they have a long way to go when they're, uh, and so we have a big business in China uh, trying to help uh, the, the new college graduates uh, succeed. And then you can say, well, what do you do about it? Is there anything that you can do to, uh, to fix it? And, and this just shows you, yes, you can. Uh, and this is an example for where they had uh, 2,000, 2,600 uh, people, and uh, they, uh, they were asked uh, what was their level uh, of competence uh, on some behaviors. And then uh, and the, the yellow is uh, the uh, observers. These are the supervisors of their people, and this is the people themselves. And then after training, they <coughs> asked the same questions. And you can see they went up. So it's trainable. That's the whole point. That, uh, that, and that's what management's interested in. They're interested in getting people d better, helping people do better for the people's own sake and for the organization's sake. OK, then at middle management, uh, that's equally a big, big use of it. And here we use uh, professional assessors. Uh, used to be that we 
would use managers to be the assessors, particularly for the supervisory level. Uh, that's sort of dying out now, too, because the, the middle managers, ha used to be a lot of middle managers uh, per organization, and now they've cut way back on them, and they don't have so many. But particularly at the, profession, at the middle management level, and for the assessment of middle managers and for the assessment of senior managers, we use professional assessors. And the assessment center is much different than what you saw before, and I want you to see a modern assessment center. Kita akan menyaksikan film tentang uh, assessor sekarang dan assessment center zaman sekarang. Kalau tadi kan kita menyaksikan film tentang sejarah bagaimana assessment center itu dimulai dan digunakan. Ah, sementara ada yang mau nanya nih, Bill, there's questions. So yeah. while we're waiting yes, for sure, the video, sure. yeah, please. Yes, sir. Yes, over here. Okay, thank you. Uh, firstly, I want to Thank you for your valuable lecture here now. Uh, I have two questions about the function of the assessment center. Uh, you explained that uh, the optimization of the assessment center used to choose the structural level in organization. Uh, my question is, does assessment center also can be used for the functional level, let's say uh, for university, for lecturer. Uh, is it, uh, yeah, I, I just want to know about your opinion. And the second uh, question is for the assessment center in the public organization. Uh, how, uh, how many the, what I don't think the the level of uh, what is it? the level of the output of the assessment center in public organization uh, for the performance in the future because uh, may, there are different yeah Be different uh, yeah. for the private and the for public in the public organization there are some systems or regulation or policy that uh, strict the leader for initiate for the creative and etc yeah maybe you have uh, some experience in your country or in something else. sure there are two questions the first one was can you do it for sort of a professional job you know and uh, yes you can and I've seen it done with lawyers with doctors that it's quite common now in medical schools in America to uh, try to teach uh, the interpersonal skills that a doctor has to have uh, in addition to the technical skills and they use an assessment center like uh, uh, situation for that uh, but it's not very common uh, that's that the, the assessment center is expensive uh, even now where we've automated a lot of parts of it is still pretty expensive and so you want to save it for the times where you have the, there's nothing better. There's not, you know, uh, there's no other alternative that's good. And so that's usually looking in the organization where that, where the biggest jump is. Uh, where, 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 where are we having the most failure? Are we, you know, if, if you're in middle management, if one out of every two people that we promote to middle management fails, then we got to come up with a better system. 
right? Then, then the question was about government use of assessment government, and it is very widely used in government because in, in America, they don't trust the system uh, that uh, they have now. And so they want outsiders to come in and help them make judgment, and it acts as a standard. So almost all the police management in the company, country are selected using assessment centers. Same with fire departments. Same with different parts of the federal government. Uh, uh, and I could tell you wonderful stories, very interesting ones. We worked with the FBI for years, and uh, I, I just loved it. <laughs> you know, it was fun, fun organization to put in assessment centers for them. Uh, and so it, uh, uh, it, it, in America, that, and around the world, uh, it's widely used uh, there. Now there's issues, but uh, it's better than anything else. <laughs> That's all I have to say. Is that okay? okay. Uh, second question. Okay. There's a question. We entertain question first, Bill. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Sure. I, I love questions, so. Uh, thank you. May I speak in Bahasa Indonesia? Okay, thank you. Uh, terima kasih. Perkenalkan nama saya Randy dari Balai Besar Latihan Kerja Industri Serang di bawah Kementerian Tenaga Kerja dan Transmigrasi. Kebetulan saat ini saya menjabat sebagai analis kepegawaian di BPNK Serang. Uh, yang pertama, langsung saja. Uh, tadi Ibu menjelaskan dan juga Pak William menjelaskan bahwa yang disebut assessment center itu tidak kemudian seperti uh, mungkin ujian sekolah gitu kan pakai yeah. multiple choice tetapi yang saya lihat di BKN itu ternyata memakai CAT atau computer assisted test gitu untuk seleksi uh, eselon 1 maupun eselon 2 di beberapa kementerian maupun pemerintah daerah nah apakah memang seperti yang ibu jelaskan tadi bahwa ini BKN sudah memakai assessment center yang benar sesuai standar internasional atau hanya baru sebatas uh, formalitas begitu untuk ya sekedar untuk publik tahu begitu. Kemudian yang kedua e, menarik dengan penjelasan Pak William bahwa di Amerika sendiri juga mungkin e, para pengambil kebijakan atau decision makernya juga kurang percaya dengan sistem yang ada. Nah kalau kemudian e, assessment center ini sudah dipakai di dunia militer di sana, bagaimana kemudian dengan e, rekrutmen untuk kalau di sini kita katakan sebagai seleksi CPNS di sana saya kurang tahu namanya apa begitu. Apakah ini juga dipakai assessment center ini untuk rekrutmen uh, public servant begitu? Dan bagaimana kemudian uh, prosedurnya? Terima kasih. Thank you. The first question is actually about the uh, Indonesian Civil Servant Agency, Civil Servant National Civil Servant Agency. Uh, he mentioned that actually the National Civil Servant Agency is using the computer assisted test, right? where they call it as assessment centers. Yes. So I, I've seen it and it's not an assessment center. Langsung dijawab ya, Mas. Jadi kita udah datang juga ke sana. So both of us going there and telling them that it's not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yang kedua, uh, he said, uh, does in America assessment center also use for selecting a civil servant? For yes, yeah, there's no question. It is used very widely for selecting civil servants. The, in business in America, it is more often used for development. Uh, but in government, uh, it is used some for development. Uh, but there's a whole lot of use for selection. Other questions, or we just watch the video, yeah? Oh, sure. yes. So you say that uh, assessment center based on behavior and economy. So it means that the evaluator have to know or expert in human behavior. So how come a uh, uh, department develop uh, assessment center, if they have no uh, person inside their organization that 
expert in human behavior, especially human behavior at work in that area of work in their uh, organization. So that just means that for developing a uh, development center, first you have to look for people that expert in human behavior, or you have to develop it first in your organization. Okay, uh, the, you're, you're right that we build an assessment center. Well, first, we have to, I mean, be sure you understand, most assessment centers are aimed at a level. They're not aimed at a job. So it's first level management, middle management, top management. So the assessment centers are aimed there. Uh, now, so if you want to start one, you need to bring in people who can do a job analysis. You don't have to have those people inside your organization. In fact, I believe you sort of do a better job if you don't have people who are taking a fresh look at the, at the jobs and seeing what makes people fail and what makes people succeed and teasing out the competencies and behaviors. And then we check that and we send out lists and we get people to evaluate uh, does this describe the job, doesn't, so there's a lot of buy-in from all levels of people uh, uh, into that. And then uh, I think it's a professional jo uh, job to come up with the simulations that will bring out those behaviors. And, and you, you might think, well, we just make the simulation to be just like the job. That's not right. That's not an assessment center because everybody's job's a little bit different. You've got different response at the same level. There are different responsibilities and things. So if I make the job just, if make my assessment center just like your job, he's gonna complain because he, he says, oh, there's stuff he has an advantage because it's more like his job. So what we do is we, we, when we say simulate the job, we mean simulate the essence of the job the competent, the, the judgments, the interpersonal things. So it, if it's, uh, so we don't make it exactly like the job. We, we bring out the behavior in the job. And it's built to bring out behavior. So then we train the assessors to observe that behavior. They don't have to know anything about the job. They just have to know about the simulation. And so we have unbelievably high uh, reliability. I mean, it's almost so high you can't measure it. It's 0.1 because we uh, now, is, if you get to see in the video, is it going to be on? Okay. Uh, you're going to get to say we use all videotapes. And so, so every fifth ob observation is, is checked by a second person. And we do all these correlations. And if she starts to be being too hard or too easy, then we take, pull out and train her some more, and we're constantly looking at the reliability of the instrument. Okay, I think you understand better when you see the video. Organizations had flattened their structure had cut out a lot of middle managers and there just weren't people to be assessors. So rather than give up the value of the assessment center method, they decided they would outsource assessment to organizations like DDI that had professional assessors. The use of professional assessors has allowed for significant changes in how assessment centers are conducted. At lower organizational levels, individuals take part in simulations administered by a computer no assessors are present. Instead, assessors, who may be located many miles away, study video recordings and other outputs from the simulations to evaluate the behavior exhibited. Assessment centers also now employ other technologies, such as web-based tests and simulations, and phone-based simulations and interviews. These technologies make it possible to ask questions and record responses digitally. They also guide assessors' behavioral observations and scoring, helping to ensure that accurate final decisions are made. 
The greatest impact of assessors has been at the executive level. Today, DDI operates assessment centers all over the world that are vastly different than the traditional assessment center of the past. The simulations that are used accurately reflect the very difficult, busy challenges of today's executives. The assessors use technology to observe behavior, record behavior, and to integrate their observations. And because we have professional assessors, they're able to get, use personality tests and other instruments that give us a more holistic view of the individual. We call these new assessment centers acceleration centers because they help people accelerate their development within an organization because they have a better understanding of their strengths and weaknesses. The executive assessment process begins with the individuals being assessed, executives or aspiring executives, visiting the center website to learn about what to expect at the acceleration center event. They learn about a fictitious but realistic company its structure, goals, product portfolio, people, and financials, and about the responsibilities of the position they will assume during their participation in the assessment simulation. The website also provides information about the feedback and development planning support assessees will receive after the Acceleration Center and what their organization expects of them in return for this investment in their development. In addition, Participants complete online personality surveys and other background information as part of their initial set of activities prior to the assessment simulation day. On the day of the assessment, the individual arrives early in the morning and is provided with further orientation and detail on the agenda for the acceleration center day. After the brief orientation, the participant is shown to the fully equipped office he or she will use. A number of appointments have been scheduled. For example, the individual might start off with an appointment with a direct report who is struggling to rally needed support for an important initiative. Then there is a teleconference with a critical customer to address some pressing issues and concerns. In between meetings, the participant continues to work on issues, make decisions, and provide guidance to others. Later, the participant needs to meet with a colleague to address relationship concerns and demonstrate influence to gain commitment for an action or initiative the individual wants to achieve. In addition to the other meetings, the participant may need to meet with a member of the media and address questions about a recent public relations issue involving the company's products. Executive participants are also required to work on strategic and long-range issues as well. During the assessment day, they analyze challenges facing the organization and the multiple factors impacting performance. With this insight, participants craft strategic recommendations and plans to address the long-term viability of the organization. Just like in real executive work settings, there are no scheduled breaks and the individual is not given a scheduled amount of time to prepare for a simulation. Instead, he or she decides when to take breaks and how much preparation is needed for the meetings and for presenting the business plan. Finally, at the end of the day, the assessee must present the business plan that he or she has developed and answer key questions about their thought process. During the day, the individual's interactions, presentation, voicemails, and emails are recorded and saved electronically. DDI's highly trained assessors evaluate each exercise independently and qualify their ratings, which are then integrated with other inputs, such as personality data, in a consensus conversation to arrive at reliable competency ratings, key themes, and business-relevant insights.
The completion of the Acceleration Center Simulation Day sets the stage for critical next steps in the development process. Soon, the leader will participate in a one-on-one -on -one feedback conversation with an executive coach. The coaching session aids in understanding the assessment results and provides developmentally focused feedback in the context of their role and business challenges back on the job. Later, a focused development plan will be crafted, outlining learning activities, developmental application activities, stretch assignments, timelines, and the support needed from key individuals. Apakah ada pertanyaan lagi sebelum kita lanjut? Ya. There's one question, one question here. Yes. So there are three questions. Yeah, my name is Berli from Faculty of Economics. Uh, so actually, uh, I think that the more appropriate or precise uh, name is the assessment of work simulation center. Because yeah, you uh, depend a lot on the simulating the work, the work environment. So yeah, as, as academics, so I just would like to know from your side, what do you think is the limit? Yeah, because yeah, any method would not could not be panacea that cured all. So just want you know you to, you to, to state what is the limit of uh, the effectiveness of this approach. What uh, type of job or uh, skill that hard to simulate uh, using this method? Thank you. Uh, I, I thought I understood the question at the beginning. Uh, the uh, uh, you are simulating behavior, so it works for all behavior, uh, but it's where does there have a payoff? Where would it be worth the investment of time and energy? That's the issue. I thought at the beginning of your question, you were saying that there are, of course, other things that have to do with job success. The environment you, that w in which you work, the culture of the organization, the, the organization itself is it efficient and everything. Assessment centers don't have anything to do with that. that that's other kinds of problems. It's not, assessment centers are not going to, to uh, solve every problem. They solve the problem that is most difficult for most people is it's the people side when if you look at failures in organizations very seldom do they fail because they're not smart enough or they're not strategic enough even they fail because they can't get along with people it, over and over again there have been one study after another that's what we're looking at here and we're looking at those strategy and things that's important to do because we can develop those things but the main thing that we're getting is an unusually good view of what makes people succeed and and fail in a way that we can fix it the, the big difference between a personality test and a uh, an assessment center is that it's hard to change your personality and if you get feedback saying you're not uh, uh, aggressive or you're uh, you 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 change your mind all the time or something like that uh, or you know you're uh, too excitable or some things like that that's hard to deal with uh, these are lifelong things that have been built into you. Uh, we, take, uh, we take those, we still use personality tests, but we uh, put those together with behavioral data and we come up with behavioral fixes for people. And so we're, it, it's one of the great things about uh, a assessment center is it is so much easier to understand. I'm sure the people in this room right now have a very good understanding about what an assessment center is. And if you got feedback from an assessment center, you would say, okay, they probably have a pretty accurate understanding of me. But if I give you a bunch of tests 
and the only data you get are that you passed the test or you didn't, then I'll tell you, you can have a lot of questions about that. Were they, is the test accurate, you know? Does it really see me? Or I was sick that day, or, you know, all these kinds of, uh, of issues. And so, in general, particularly at higher levels, the big growth of assessment is at high levels uh, of the organization. More and more companies are, you know, they have two or three good people in their company who they want to promote, but they also have some people from outside, and they would like to get a check on that. And they put them all through an assessment center, and they can compare their uh, uh, data. And they, th this is not making the decision, it's informing the decision, giving people a better outlook. And in fact, the big thing it does is it makes people us. I can't tell you how many times someone would, would be nominated for a position. And the boss says, good guy, definitely want him. Uh, and then he goes through an assessment center. And then we provide the report to the boss and the boss's boss. And, and the boss looks at it and says, this report is exactly right. He's, I've told him that over and over, and he's been that way for five years and all that, but somehow it never came out in the discussion. It never, you know, the, the people avoided it. And what the, it, this is just a stimulant to be thinking about it. Uh, you know, I, I remember very well uh, early back in my days at JCPenney, which is a long time ago, uh, I had a, uh, uh, one of the, a young man went through the uh, program, uh, and he did extremely well, wonderfully. And, and his boss happened to be there near me, and I said, how could this guy not have been promoted? He's past the time that he normally would have been promoted. And, and the guy said, well, you know, the truth is that when he was a management trainee in the company, uh, he made the decision to buy all kind, a whole big lot of college sweatshirts. And we couldn't sell those sweatshirts. We probably had to give them away. And every time I look at him, I think of those sweatshirts. You see, so he was being held back because of an old bias that he had. Uh, and I want to point out that's, that story has another meaning because Assessment centers don't always find poor people, they find good people. And in big organizations, it's amazing how many good people there are that nobody knows about because they're not near the home office or they're not in a job which exposes them to higher management. And this is a way to take a look across a broad array of people. And, uh, and find out who the people are who will be, or who will get more from our investment in those people. And so it, it really helps you. You have another question? Just a short follow up question. So, yeah, because they are in, uh, they know they are doing simulation and they will be assessed that affect their career. Do you ever uh, find or see the proportion of people that can uh, behave differently during simulation and outside the? assessment center. So, I mean, yeah, they know, so they try to perform better. Okay. The, the uh, issue, the uh, question is, uh, do people perform in the assessment center the same way they would perform in the same situation on the job? Isn't that correct? And the answer is yes, because you forget that you are in a simulation. So help me God, you do. You get so involved in it, you're, you're, you're actively giving back back and forth, talking back and forth to someone, trying to convince them to do something, and they're pushing back and you've got to answer their question. You, if you're leading a group, you've got a bunch of people who are not cooperating and you've got to bring them. You forget about that, that it's, so the first, when you first come in, for the first five or 10 minutes, you think, boy, I'm going to be really, but then they become themselves. And, uh, and so it's not a problem. Other, we have uh, five minutes or something. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, Mr. Behem, I would like to ask you, or maybe you can share your experience as a consultant concerning the assessment centers. As we know that uh, we cannot ignore the globalization and diversity in every organization. So we have uh, many, a lot of multinational corporations, multicultural organizations. Please uh, share with us, could you please tell us, what are the obstacles whether uh, when you try to apply the assessment centers among organizations that very different, culturally different. Let's say, for example, in Indonesia, we are a, a bit a collective society. And in America, uh, maybe American people are individualistic. And please correct me if I'm wrong, that based on the film, that the, as, to assess the future, the potential future of person, uh, I saw that it is uh, assessment based on individual. Can we uh, adapt the tools of assessment centers in uh, collective societies or collective organization? And could you please say that's, that's a good question. Uh, and the answer is that in Indonesia, we have Indonesians assessing Indonesians. And that's as good as I can do uh, to help. We have people who understand the culture here. Now, the other part of your story, of the uh, question you have, is, uh, has a little different answer. Uh, and it is the fact that most of the multinational companies want a worldwide standard. They don't want an Indonesian standard because they want to move their people around the world. And, uh, and so they, you, for those people, we use a, a worldwide standard and so they can pick someone out from this country, move them to that country and so forth. And so that's almost all the big companies do that. It's not that much different, but it's, we, we try to give that every consideration. There's got one more, one, I think. One more on the right. Uh, we, we haven't had any women. We like to, to yeah. All men. Oh, no, well, next you have to wait. He's got the microphone. Then I'll come back to you. Okay. Me? Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunities. Uh, my name is Zoya. I'm a, I'm a big fan. <laughs> I'm a big fan of your work. The targeted selection system is, I think, is ingenious. I, 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 it's uh, like I see the chamber of the human resource management. And I'm, I'm, I'm just quite wondering, and you talk about, you discuss about the key action. Uh, I just wondering how do you find it? How do you define it? But uh, uh, is it just by using the job analysis? How do you find the specific uh, behavior that uh, could be a good predictor of people's success? And um, probably almost identical with the other question is uh, what uh, kind of challenges, uh, obstacle of difficulties that you are uh, having when you are uh, assessing or you are conducting your method in Indonesian company, probably maybe in a uh, government uh, institution. I mean, I think that in my opinion, as finding Kimi Hoffa is much more easier than finding, identifying competency of competent people in our government organization. <laughs> I think that's, uh, how do you, well, you share? Uh, it, it, it's, it's not really, it, uh, it's not more difficult to find competencies because DDI has looked at competencies in thousands and thousands and thousands of companies. And you may think that your company is totally different than everybody else, but it isn't. And, uh, and so uh, where we get the key actions is through the job analysis and also the part I didn't get to is through training. We the important thing is to link the assessment with training. In most cases, it, you know, it's not going to do you any good to come up with a good evaluation. That's only a starting point. And then you need really good training to, to fix it. And when, we, when you're starting to divide, devise the training, then that helps expose the steps, the key actions. And so we have already 
a, what we think is the ultimate list of competencies for the world. And these are hundreds of competencies. And then, were ch then we just basically choose among those. And we have worked out the key actions for each of those. And so it, it, if you didn't know anything about assessment and you were starting from scratch or the clean sheet of paper, that would be really hard. But fortunately, we're not in that situation. And so we don't uh, have that. Do you want to have I have uh, one other yeah. question. But, uh, what, uh, can you tell me what kind of, speaking of competency, what do you think is the, uh, the specific competency, the specific skill or knowledge or competency that an assessor must need? Does uh, being a psychologist could give a uh, competitive ex uh, uh, to, You're asking for it to be an assessor? Or, or to be a participant. What kind of skill, competencies, or uh, knowledge? Because I've met an assessor who has an uh, educational background as a mechanical engineer. Well, you <laughs> let her answer. <laughs> let me answer that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So qualifications for good assessors. Uh, his question is, is it? Answer. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just answer. Okay, boss. Uh, uh, basic qualifications. Actually, there's only two. You have a good ability to learn. And second one is a good communications and cooperation, working relationships. Because that's those two basic skills that are needed as an assessor. Because every time you will do assessment centers, you will need, first you need to learn about the program itself. What are the simulations that we are going to use in that program? So you need to quickly learn, absorb, and understand the context and the, the program itself. And then, of course, you really need to have a very good communication skills and a good interpersonal relationship skills. Because of what? Because as an assessor, you are not working alone. You are working in a team with another assessors. And at the end of every time you finish up uh, the evaluating the candidates or the participants, in a performance in the assessment centers, you have to come to a data integration process where you communicate all your findings, your evidence. Okay, I mean, I'm sure you're, you're confused, and let me just explain something. Uh, my company has 50 IO site, uh, organizational PhDs and another more than 50 uh, master's degree. Their job is to design the assessment center. That's the, that then we, we don't feel you need to be a PhD to be an assessor because we, you, you can't, we have focused the assessor's attention on specific behavior and a specific exercise and it, uh, you don't need to be a psychologist, I guarantee you. Now we use psychometric tests and when we use psychometric tests, we use a psychologist. But, but for the behavioral part, we use people who have had business experience and, and, uh, and, and have the skills to, to learn the system and to communicate it. Okay? Right, we have, I, I let her have her. It's being passed down behind you. Good morning, Ms. Uh, Dr. William C. B. Hamm. Thanks for um, uh, this master lecture. I would like to, not to give you a question, but I just uh, uh, very um, glad to this uh, meeting, uh, to this forum. This is what, uh, what we waiting for about 11 years ago before the assessment centers booming in Indonesia. Please introduce me, Nikan Avianti, alumni from Psychology of University of Indonesia, 1994. Those all um, sit in front of me is my uh, lecture. Mm, uh, can I speak in Bahasa? Because um, uh, my yes, note in uh, my statement is a suggestion to my beloved Dean, Bapak Wilman. Okay, uh, saya terima kasih sekali. Um, akhirnya pertemuan ini diinisiasikan uh, oleh um, Mbak Vina dengan tim Mbak Ndai juga dari DDI. Tapi satu hal di sini saya terharu sekali karena memang 
dari beberapa pertanyaan teman-teman uh, uh, lecture maupun lecture yang muda-muda maupun yang sudah senior bahkan saya yakin diantara mereka semua adalah uh, asesor satu hal di sini ada gap sepertinya uh, bahwa uh, sebetulnya uh, kebutuhan dari assessment center itu di Indonesia seperti yang tadi Mbak Vina sudah sampaikan sudah didokumentasikan dalam bentuk yang uh, standar artinya sudah masuk dalam uh, kantor Kementerian BUMN di mana uh, saya sendiri dari lembaga manajemen FUI saya alumni psikologis dari UI tetapi saya um, lebih banyak um, mengabdikan di lembaga manajemen FUI artinya kenapa di sini ada captive market yang it's very challenging Mr. Behem in Indonesia what we are not um, supported by the faculty of psychology is the curriculum so please um, Pak Dekan monggo kami dari lembaga manajemen dan saya yakin juga teman-teman dari DDI akan siap untuk mengadakan kerjasama dalam bentuk internship program karena kami sendiri um, merasakan kesulitan dalam hal merekrut um, competence assessor yes, that's it. jadi artinya uh, lembaga manajemen uh, pada tahun 2012 ini ditunjuk uh, satu dari tujuh dengan DDI juga there is a seven consultant here uh, assigned by SOE Inter uh, Ministry in government in Indonesia and we proud of that um, we have uh, limited sources of certified assessor and bless me uh, after um, graduated from University of Indonesia I'm um, basically me by myself uh, come to DDI um, I'm a certified assessor but from uh, Bank Negara Indonesia 46 and from a certified assessor also in from uh, SHL Safil Horsworth but um, I think uh, I'm the one of the um, not most of us, um, my friends in here, if graduated from, has the same uh, opportunity, right? So please, um, our beloved Dean, <laughs> Pak Wilman, please take it as the curriculum assessment center. Just for information, um, in Faculty of Economy, there's assessment center curriculum here embedded in HR uh, management. So. Um, artinya di teman-teman di Fakultas Ekonomi assessment center itu sudah masuk dalam kurikulum dari um, manajemen SDM yaitu untuk um, bachelor degree bachelor degree dalam mata kuliah pilihan alangkah um, baiknya kalau um, Fakultas Psikologi yang memang betul-betul mengeluarkan mengeluarkan um, um, mensuplai lah ya mensuplai dari uh, para tenaga asesor ini so please we are equipped by the assessment center method from A to Z so I would please and I'm sure that um, this is the momentum that um, we can grasp it okay thank you that was a wonderful way to end the program thank you very much thank you all very much for having me Yeah, I can if I want to. I thought we were supposed to be over to let uh, Beliau masih bersedia menerima pertanyaan. Okay, thank you, Dr. Baiham. Uh, I agree that assessment center is indeed very important and maybe the most effective tool for development and succession plan. My concern here is about the long processes and the investment costs. And uh, how could this make it uh, more affordable, especially for SME, small and medium enterprises? Thank you. Let me hit the uh, issue. Uh, it is the best method, but also the most expensive. And so, it's not appropriate. I, where I believe in paper and pencil tests. I believe, certainly believe in interviews. I have invented what's called behavioral interview, uh, and it, it is the most widely 
the interviewing system. Uh, and I believe in all things, and many times that's enough. But when you reach these jumps in, in people's life, from into vision or into the strategic level of the organization, where you're, those, you can't interview people about those things because they've never had an opportunity to do it. Uh, and the assessment center is a good thing. <laughs> the, uh, and so what, uh, what our charge is to make assessment centers as efficient as possible. And if I had more time, I would love to show you some of the uh, ways that we've done that. But we've really, uh, at the supervisory level, made it all computers, computerized. The computer acts, collects all the data. We still have assessors, but the com you're interacting with the computer. And that's what people do in the job. So we're not doing something that's different. They're sending emails and they're talking and voicemail and so forth. So, uh, and that cuts the cost because we're making the job of the assessor more efficient. Uh, and we make, make cutting down and things. So that's the direction where the field is going is more automation, just like everything else, more automation is an answer. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, and, but the other, I don't want to forget, the, where the field is going is making this a key part of development. The, uh, uh, our, what managers want in companies is not more assessment centers. They could care less about assessment centers. They want better people. And the assessment center is only a start towards that. But it's a wonderful way of diagnosing. If you went to a doctor and, and he doesn't say a word to you. He just looks, pulls out a package and hands you some pills. W would you go back to that doctor again? No, you wouldn't. Uh, you want a doctor that does all kinds of examinations and finds out what you need and then gives you something to fix it. And that's what we do with assessment and that is the key point in the whole thing. Yeah. Huh? Last questions, Bill, because our, we are running out of time. Terima kasih. I will take this opportunity to speak in Bahasa so Mbak Pina bisa, moderatornya bisa berperan gitu ya. <coughs> Yang pertama Mbak Pina <coughs> sampaikan ke Pak Bill bagaimana menyusun kompetensi anti korupsi. Hmm. Langkah-langkahnya gimana? Karena 2014 sebentar lagi sudah terjadi pilek, pilpres, dan seterusnya. Mm -hmm. Itu yang pertama. Dan kedua, kompetensi moralitas. Jadi, morality behavior. Morality behavior dan anti-korupsi kom kompetensi, kira-kira gitulah ya. Jadi, itu bagaimana nyusunnya, tahap-tahapnya. Gitu ya. Yang kedua, tadi dikatakan oleh Prof. Bill bahwa assessment center is expensive. Mm -hmm. nah, bagaimana caranya kita ada mutu di restoran itu, rasa bintang lima, tapi harga kaki lima. Nah, bagaimana membangun assessment center yang seperti itu tidak mahal tapi karena kalau lihat piramida purchasing power mm -hmm. apa, ekonomi bangsa ini mm -hmm. kan ada di bawah jadi yang mahal-mahal kan cuma sedikit, nah bagaimana membangun itu mm -hmm. dan yang terakhir kalau boleh, apa kelemahan assessment center menurut Pak Bill, terima kasih uh, Bill, the, the first question is that uh, how you gonna define the competencies of anti-corruption? Huh? <laughs> I have been here making presentations for a week and that comes up in every uh, issue and, and the usually first question, how do you assess integrity? And the assessment center is not the answer to that. I believe, frankly, it is good interviewing, good behavioral-based interviewing, which I could tell you all about, but we don't have time. But assessment centers are not going to do that. But they're going to, to find the, many of the causes, sort of, a, a, uh, 
we could easily assess the ability of people to to find where there seems to be an integrity problem in their organization. Uh, we, we could assess, one of the problems with integrity is that managers don't confront it because they're afraid. But if we can assess that and train them to give the supervisors confidence to when there's a first little hint of integrity problems that they take action on that, we can assess that. We can assess sort of the, all the things around integrity, but not integrity itself. Oh, up, yeah. Jadi memang integrity itu memang susah sekali ya untuk diukur melalui assessment center. Uh, oh, so you have more questions than yeah. I, I was the, the, going to make yeah. a point, I thought. The, the other question is, I think you already answered that about how to make, because assessment center is so expensive, how to make that more efficient. I think you already covered in previous, yeah, that right. you use technology, but, but I, I, I want to, that's the point, I'll end on this point, I promise, uh, that it is more expensive, but it is a lot less expensive than a failure on the job. There have been many research studies about what is the value of a good manager versus a poor manager, and you're dealing with millions of dollars often, millions of dollars. And so uh, it's, it's all relative, more, it's more expensive than a piece of paper, which is a paper and pencil test. Uh, but if it gives you better data and you have fewer failures, it's worth it. And I'll just give you one example here. This is a research study done on, uh, on uh, it, it's in a uh, uh, sort of Starbucks-like organization. Uh, and they have, uh, they have uh, district managers. Uh, and they uh, put uh, all their district managers through uh, an assessment center for development. And then they looked at the sales of the stores in their district. And, and then they, so they looked at what the people who did poorly in assessment, how well did their stores do? And the average store, had sales of 100 and almost 135 million dollars. I think that's for a month. I think, and the and the average the average store had sales of 136 million dollars. The people who did poorly in assessment, their sales were down here, and the people who did well in assessment. Their sales were up here, and so, so if you use the assessment center for prediction, for promotion in this case, uh, or develop them so that they have the skills, there is a savings of 12 million, almost 13 million dollars per person. So uh, that's a sizable reason for doing it, and no matter how expensive the assessment center is, it's a lot less expensive than that. So thank you very, very much. Baiklah, Bapak Ibu sekalian, terima kasih sekali atas perhatiannya. Kami sudah memberikan cukup banyak uh, dan senang sekali ya atas respons pertanyaan-pertanyaannya. Beliau senang kalau dapat pertanyaan. Cuman kan karena sebentar lagi akan waktunya sholat Jumat, jadi beliau juga cukup sensitif akan hal itu, jadi dia bilang, Pina, we have to cut this. Uh, terima kasih kepada Mbak Pina, and thank you for the mafil lecture from Mr. Byham. So we would like you to stay for a moment because uh, we want to give you a placard as an appreciation for the today's master lecture. So, uh, Mr. Dean, Padekan, Wilman Dahlan Mansur, dipersilakan untuk maju ke depan dan memberikan.
Selanjutnya uh, akan diminta uh, untuk Mbak Vina untuk memberikan buku dari Daya Dimensi Indonesia kepada Fakultas Psikologi Universitas Indonesia yang akan diwakilkan oleh Mbak Riva Curmutia. Dipersilakan maju ke depan. So for the library, we give books. Buku-buku karya Ke beliau. Kelima buku yang akan diberikan dari DDI berjudul pertama Grow Your Own Leader, kedua Seventy The New Fifty, ketiga Performance Management, keempat Dynamic Governance Embedding Culture, dan kelima Leadership Success in China. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're very glad to have you here.